Hi, hello. So last time we talked about linear independence and we described specifically the interaction between linear dependence and independence and, uh, and adding elements to the set. So we're going to, the, the, the check-in is going to focus on that. And we'll, uh, last time we noticed that it, uh, it had something to do, linear independence has some interaction with, with span. And so this time we'll combine the two in what is probably the most important single idea of the course, most important sort of single definition of the course, or maybe after the definition of vector space itself. Okay. So, uh, so you can see the question asks me to find a spanning set for the plane, and that's a pretty routine spanning set for the plane. That's a pretty routine question from the homework, and show the spanning set is linearly independent. And then finally, I'm going to add a vector to that spanning set and, and ask whether the new, the resulting set is uh, linearly independent or dependent. Okay, so uh, let's let's give it a try. So. Um, uh, let's see if I can remember the, the plane through the origin first. It is uh, the set of all x, y, z, where uh, it's what uh, x plus 2y minus z equals 0. And we've seen before how to do this. The idea is to view this as a one equation linear system. So x is leading, y and z are free, and you express x in terms of y and z. You get the set of x, y, z, where um, x is uh, minus 2y plus z. And then you rewrite that as the set of minus 2y plus z, y, z. And the advantage is here that y and z are free. So no longer do you have to worry about some interaction between the variables. Instead, you just take any y and any z, and this is a very straightforward criteria for membership in this set. We have, uh, we have liked to break out the y and the z in the description. So I'm looking at what minus 2, 1, 0 times y, and uh, is it 1, 0, 1 times z? Okay, so that makes the spanning set manifestly from this description. A person can see that the spanning set is this vector and this vector, and any combination of those two vectors suffices to make any any member of the plane. That's just obvious from that description. So uh, the spanning set is going to consist of the two vectors, minus two one zero, and uh, one zero one. The second part asked me to show that that's linearly independent, so we, that's not hard. Oops, this was the first part. Here's the second part. Show that that's linearly independent. That's not hard once you know the idea for computing whether or not a set is linearly independent. It's very straightforward. You make a combination of the two vectors, minus 2, 1, 0, and uh, 1, 0, 1, add to uh, 0, 0, 0. And th that leads me to a linear system. Let's see, what is it? Uh, minus 2C1 plus C2 equals 0. C1 plus 0 equals 0. And C2 uh, plus, plus, plus 0 equals 0. And so obviously here, there's a unique solution. C1 equals C2 equals 0. And so you conclude that... Uh, Oops, I wrote two L's. You conclude that you have linear independence. Okay. So that so that calculation is relatively straightforward. And now there's the part I knew I would forget this part. I have to add a vector. Oh, one one two. That's right. I have to add a vector to the set one one two and decide whether the result is linearly independent or dependent. So I uh, I'm I'm gonna need a piece of paper for that, let's see. So for part three, what I want to do is I want to consider the set. It's a new set, so I'll give it a new name. S hat will be, uh, is it minus 2? Minus 2, 1, 0. And then, whoops, 1, 0, 1. And then um, it, it is 1, 1, 2. And I want to decide whether that's linearly independent or dependent. But the lesson that we learned last time, the thing that, that this check-in is reminding a person about, the lesson that we learned last time is that the original set here, S, these two vectors, the original set is linearly independent. 
So the result will be linearly independent if the new vector is something brand new. If 1, 1, 2 is not in the span of these two, if 1, 1, 2 is not in the span of S, then the result will be linearly independent. On the other hand, if 1, 1, 2 is in the span of S, if 1, 1, 2 is a repeat in the kind of language we were using in the first day or two, if 1, 1, 2 is not in the span of S, you get linear independence. If 1, 1, 2 is in the span of S, you have linear dependence. Okay, so I'm going to note here, we know what the span of S is. It's the set of, it's a set of vectors that satisfy the criteria x plus 2y minus z equals 0. So I'm going to note that 1, 1, 2 does not satisfy x plus 2y minus z equals 0. Does not satisfy. So that means 1, 1, 2 is not in the span of S. 1, 1, 2 is not a linear combination of these two. 1, 1, 2 is not in the span of S, so, uh, so, it, so it should be linearly independent. The result, S hat, should be a linearly independent set. I, I'm going to check that with the actual calculation, but we already know from the results we saw last time that because 1, 1, 2 is genuinely new, genuinely new, that it will result, it, adding it will result in in maintaining and preserving the linear independence of the of the set. So when we go from S to S hat, we preserve the linear independence. So uh, anyway, I'm going to do the problem as though I hadn't noticed that. So I'm looking at C1 by minus 2, 1, 0. C2 by 1, 0, 1. And C3 by 1, 1, 2 equals 0, 0, 0. Okay, and then uh, I get a linear system. Oh, uh, minus 2, C1 plus C2 plus C3 equals 0. Uh, C1 plus C3 equals 0. And C2 plus 2C3 equals 0. And we've done so many of these. Uh, 1 half row 1 plus row 2 uh, minus 2C1 plus C2 plus C3 equals 0. That one's unchanged, of course. The next row gives me a, what? A 1 half C2 plus 3 halves C3 equals 0. And then, of course, the bottom row is unchanged. So C2 plus 2C3 equals 0. And then one more step. i got to use this to get rid of that. So uh, I'm looking at minus 2, row 2, plus row 3. Copy down the first row. I should have done this with a raise. Huh? It would have been less writing. Minus 2, C1, plus C2, plus C3, equals 0. 1 half C2, plus 3 half C3, equals 0. And finally, what uh, minus, minus C3 equals 0. Minus C3 equals 0. And of course, this is echelon form. I have a unique solution. There's only the unique solution must be C3 equals zero, C3 equals C2 equals C1 equals zero, and so we have linear independence. Okay, so again, we saw because of the results that we saw last time that because one one two is not in the span of S. Therefore, we would get linear independence, and indeed, that's what we found. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's uh, let's turn that now to uh, to talking about the material that we're going to do today. And the material that we're going to do today is we're going to introduce a uh, a, a new idea that tries to uh, tries to sort of capture what it means to say minimal spanning set succeeds in capturing what it means to say minimal spanning set. So, uh, so basis. So a basis for a vector space is a sequence of vectors that's both linearly independent and spans the space. Now there's a couple of different things in this definition. Linear independent and spans the space. Certainly a person notices that. But the other thing that a person notices is that it's a sequence of vectors. So a sequence you'll remember is that order matters. Because the basis is a sequence, 
uh, the, I have to denote somehow that, that order matters, and to, to help a person remember that order matters, I'm using these diamond brackets that have become pretty standard way to denote a sequence of things. So the point of the diamond brackets instead of set brackets is that order matters. If I change it from beta 1, beta 2, etc., to beta 2, beta 1, that'll be a different basis. We won't see so much why that's true today, but we'll see it, it, we'll see it with the next talk. Okay, and of course I need to do an example, and the first example is a particularly commonly occurring basis. So this is a basis for the plane, 1 minus 1 and 1, 1, and again this just happens to be the case that this is a basis that comes up a lot, so it's a good first example. I can easily check that it's linearly independent, doing the kind of stuff I was doing just five minutes ago. Remind a person how to check that it spans. You can do uh, C1 plus C2 equals XY. So the idea here is that if you give me any XY in the plane, can I find the appropriate C1 and C2? And yes, this work shows you how to find the appropriate C1 and C2. Before we go any further, I'll just comment that a person undoubtedly says to themselves something like, well, you, you kind of did the same thing twice. Very true, very true. We have to get through things in a certain order. You can only do so many things at a time. But you have noticed that there's some interaction between linear independence and span. You're absolutely right about that. And, of course, we'll talk about that. All right, another example, just because basis is so important and also because I don't like to do one example of anything, especially something important. So this is the vector space of linear polynomials, uh, uh, a constant term plus a linear term. And uh, uh, one basis is, it looks like uh, the basis from the previous slide, 1 plus x and 1 minus x. Easy to verify linear independence easy to verify that it spans the space. If you give me an arbitrary element of, of the linear polynomial space, it's got a constant term and, a, and a, a linear term, and I want to say, is there a C1 and a C2? And after a little bit of arithmetic, it turns out, yes, it, take the constant coefficient plus the linear coefficient, add them, divide by 2, that's C1. Take the constant coefficient, the, the linear coefficient, do the subtraction, divide by 2, that's C2. So if you give me an A and a B, I can give you a C1 and a C2. So in short, um, uh, you can, with the right combination of these two things, get uh, get any linear any linear polynomial at all. So that makes it a basis because it combines the two things of linear independence and spans the space. And you'll notice again, I wrote it in diamond brackets because order matters, but order won't really matter until next 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 class next video. Okay, here's a basis for the two by two matrices. So uh, it, it just, uh, you know, I just made one up. Um, it's easy to verify that it's a basis. It's pretty easy to see, for example, that it's linearly independent. It's also easy to see that it spans the space. Here's another basis for the two by two matrices. So one thing that a person learns in this example without seeing the verification that these are bases, one thing a person learns in this example is that a space can have more than one basis. You'll notice that both of these have four elements that that will matter to. All right, and the, oops, hit the wrong button. So that so this is a basis for for three space, a basis for for R three. Um, uh, so it's kind of the obvious basis. It's clearly linearly independent. If you sort of close your eyes for a second and ask yourself, can one of these be a combination of the others? No. And then uh, what about, does it span? It can, if you give me an X, Y, Z, can I find an appropriate? Yeah, well, yes, obviously. I'm going to call that script E. So we're going to use E for, the, for what is the kind of the usual basis for R3. Calculus books sometimes call those I, J, and K. Um, you know, they have a different tradition that they're responding to, but, but um, one in particular point is that um, if we had uh, R4 or R5 or R6, we'd eventually run out of letters, so we're not going to do that. So it, for any Rn here, E sub n is the obvious basis, the kind of natural basis, the canonical basis, the standard basis, and I'm going to denote its members with lowercase e's. And it's uh, pretty obvious. I mean, uh, you can write it down on a piece of paper, but you, can't you do it in your head to show that it's both linearly independent and that it spans the space? 
Um, a basis is a sequence, order matters, and again, we'll see why that's important um, in the next class, um, although this theorem gives us a preview of that. But, but um, it's common practice to refer to a basis as a set, and, and uh, we'll, we'll also probably uh, routinely refer to a basis as a set. I'm just following common practice in the field. So, uh, so just so that, you know, I'm not doing any favors if I use entirely different words than everyone else in the world. Okay, so uh, basis is important for many reasons, but one reason that a basis is important is this theorem. In any vector space, a subset is a basis if and only if each vector in the space can be expressed as a linear combination of elements in the subset. Now, before I go on, all that says so far. Every element in the space can be expressed as a linear combination of, of elements in the subset. All that says so far is that, the, is that it spans the space. Well, that's part of the definition, so that's not interesting. It's the following part that makes it interesting. It says, can be expressed as a linear combination of elements in a unique way. So if I write down a basis for a space, and I figure out how to express another element of the space, it's not the case that there are two of those, or three of those, or infinitely many of those. There's only one way. If you give me a basis and an element of the space, there's exactly one way to write the space element as a combination of basis elements. And it, uh, we, we really basically saw this in the early calculations, but um, uh, 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 just to go through the proof, just to go through the argument here, is that uh, sequence is a basis if and only if the, its vectors form a set that spans and that's linearly independent. And of course, the members of that set, the, the, the subset, is a spanning set if and only if each vector in the space is a linear combination in at least one way. So, uh, emphasizing again what I said, what, what I broke off to say in the middle of the theorem, that we already know that a basis, if you drop the whole sequence thing and just call it a set, that a basis is a spanning set. So, saying that every element of the space can be expressed as a combination of basis elements and at least one way is hardly surprising. What the theorem instead say, says is that it can be expressed, also expressed as a linear combination of basis elements in at most one way. So we, we, um, we'll finish if we show that a spanning subset is linearly independent if and only if every vector in the space is a linear combination in at most one way. So basically there's a tension here. So a set gets to be linearly independent if it's small, right? It, it, suppose that you have, for example, uh, uh, vectors from the plane. We saw this in the uh, in the last in the last video. You have vectors from the plane, and you have like five of them. So we had five vectors in the plane, and we showed that you can throw things out. That that uh, a spanning set can have many many things in it, and there's no harm done. But with a linearly independent set, it tends to be it, it, it tends to be small. So spanning sets tend to be big. You throw new things in them; it doesn't do any doesn't do any harm. Linearly independent sets tend to be small because uh, if you take a linearly independent set and you put in something new, you run the danger of destroying linear independence. So there's a tension here, uh, t t trying to go top to bottom. <laughs> there's a tension here. Spanning sets try trying spanning sets have a tendency to be big. Linearly independent sets have a tendency to be small. And the spot in the middle, where you're both spanning and linearly independent, it is, uh, is sort of a sweet spot. So what we're saying is that if, if you span, then you get the at least one way. We're going to show linear independence gives you at the at most one way. And I don't have space on the slide for it, so I, I fit it onto the next slide. Okay, so here's the idea. Suppose I want to express a member of the subset in two different ways. So the member of the subset is V. V, and I'm going to express it in two different ways using the basis elements. And I use beta for the basis elements just because beta and basis just makes it, makes it more memorable. Okay, so here I go. C1, C2, etc. D1, D2, etc. Then, of course, I have equality between the two. They both equal V, so they equal each other. And you know what's going to happen. We've done so many of these now. I'm going to bring everybody over to one side of the equation and leave zero on the right-hand side. So there I did. And we recognize instantly what's happening here is that you have linear independence if and only if each of these subtractions is zero. Asserting that there's only one way, asserting that each of these subtractions is zero, asserting that C1 equals D1, 
C2 equals D2, etc. So asserting that there's only one way is exactly asserting linear independence. That's exactly what linear independence gives you. Okay, so uh, so the theorem, back to the theorem, which is an important result. In the vector space, a subset is a basis if and only if any element of the space can be expressed in exactly one way. And then uh, f next time, when we come back next time, that finishes today, when we come back next time, we're going to talk about the, that this gives us a way to, um, to, to kind of characterize members of the space, that, that, that we'll, we'll have that members of the space are characterized sort of relative to the basis. Okay, okay, very good. So we'll see you next time.